Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Hello and welcome to another episode of Business Innovators Radio. I am your host, Ralph Brogdon, and today I am speaking with Dr. Lisa Van Allen. At the intersection of business strategy, psychology, and spirituality, you will find the thought leadership of Dr. Lisa Van Allen with tools that break through belief barriers you didn't even know you had. Dr. Lisa helps you clear the path to do the work you were designed to do. Dr. Lisa is a nationally renowned inspirational speaker and the award-winning author of Your Belief Quotient, Seven Beliefs That Sabotage or Support your success. Her passion is to challenge and inspire you to make a difference while making money. Excellent. Dr. Lisa Van Allen, welcome to Business Innovators Radio. Thank you for having me. That is such a great uh, passion there. Make a difference while making money. We talked off air about how many coaches, consultants, business owners, uh, they they want to make a difference, but they mm-hmm. have a hard time with that intersection of business strategy, psychology, and, and, and even spirituality. You have perfected a way of kind of combining a lot of different things together into a very holistic approach. But um, and, and I want to dig into that. But first, tell us a little bit more about who you are and, and the type of people that you typically work with. Sure. I am. Um... I wanted to make a difference with my life from um, really the very beginning. I was a a small child wanting to have influence and impacts on people. I wanted to help. Um, In fact, I got in trouble in kindergarten for helping the other students when I got (laughs) bored. Um, (laughs) I just am naturally bent that way. And I think a lot of coaches or people who go into helping professions, I was a clinical psychologist before I was a coach. And I wanted to help people. It's why I went to school. Mm. And I found um, that it became important not just to help people, but I needed to make money. Um, I ended up divorcing my first husband, and I had to eat what I killed. (laughs) So (laughs) I had to make some money. Um, And so I learned the hard way that business is about making money. It isn't about doing great things. Um, And that's just a reality. And so after... uh, doing clinical psychology for a while. To be honest, I burned out. I was working with a really um, dramatic, acute population. And I decided I didn't want to have to carry a pager all the time anymore. And uh, I moved to the Midwest from the San Francisco Bay Area. And some dramatic changes took place in my life. And I realized I just wanted a different kind of lifestyle. And I discovered coaching almost by accident. And... um, uh, Took some training, didn't need to because of my credentials, but decided I wanted to figure out what the difference was between coaching and and, uh, therapy and got that clear in my mind. And I've been coaching now for about 10 years. Uh, Started out thinking I was going to do life coaching, probably with a spiritual flavor, just because that's the kind of person I am. I wanted to go out and and do coaching with um, uh, maybe ministry professionals or nonprofit organizations. But the problem with that is, I couldn't make any money doing it because those folks, those folks didn't have money to spend on coaching. Uh, so I fell into business coaching almost by accident. I was out networking with people um, in between um, while I was building a, a psychology practice. I had climbed the ladder at what was United Behavioral Health. It's now the mental health arm of United Healthcare. I hate to admit it, but I was part of the managed care gorilla. <laughs> and uh, I learned uh, things from a corporate perspective, I was with them for five years. Climbed the ladder, ended up ended up running their western region, uh, their network, um, hiring mental health professionals, doing quality improvement um, process things, uh, strategic planning. So I got the equivalent of, of an MBA the hard way by doing mm-hmm. it with, inside a corporation. And that business background appealed to a number of people uh, in my community, and they started hiring me to do business coaching with them. I never thought I'd be a business coach. I didn't feel qualified. I didn't, you know, I had run a couple of businesses of my own, including my clinical psych practice, which did end up being successful. But um, 
I didn't see myself as, quote, a business person. And part of my my uh, definition of what it meant to be a business person was really skewed. I didn't think helping people, people with my kind of temperament, I'm a, a creative thinker, an abstract thinker, I'm a helper, those kinds of things. I wasn't the, you know, driven masculine <laughs> dominator who's going to go out and achieve yeah. big things. That was well, like the how typical, I saw myself. The typical type A personality that's going to be no, a real slam No, I wasn't that... Yeah, type A CEO guy, you yeah. know, running the board meeting. I didn't see myself that way. Um, but the thing is, if you have a vision, um, something that you want to do, something impact that you want to make in your community or in your world, you can turn it into a business. And this is where um, this tagline of making a difference while making money came along. Um, I ended up figuring that out and then shared it with my clients. And you can't make a difference. Uh, with that thing that you're so passionate about, the thing that you were, you know, put here to do. Um, And at the same time, make money that supports the business, that makes it sustainable, um, that feeds your family. Um, And there's a piece, I think, that also internally we know that we um, have earned our keep. We Mm. need to be paid for the things that we're doing. We need to be paid well. And so there's nothing wrong with making money. And I had to get my head around that. I think a lot of coaches do. Um, I come from a a spiritual background, a church background that um, kind of pounded in our head that somehow poverty was, I don't know, to be um, wondered at and appreciated and that that was the way to go. And and I realized a long time ago, poverty is really hard. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Poverty is not Plus it's not much fun. When you have to turn off the water heater, you know, because you can't pay the water bill or, or the electric bill, or you have to start, you know, figuring out, can I keep my dog because I can't afford dog food at the grocery? Those kind of decisions are painful. Hmm. And so I decided I didn't want to live there anymore. And those are true stories. I, I thought about giving up my dog, and there was a summer where I turned off my water heater. Um, but the thing was, that was early days of my coaching practice. And I decided I wasn't going to be poor. Now, I'm not interested in being tremendously wealthy, but I want to make good money, and I want to earn my keep. I want to have a reputation of being successful, and money in our society um, is an equivalent to success in a lot of people's minds. But the main thing is, and this is a real driver for me, I want to keep doing this. Hmm. And I realized at one point, if I didn't make money, I couldn't keep doing the thing that I know I'm here to do. So I've counted this into the heads of a number of my clients, and we've beta tested it, um, of trying to figure out what would it look like? Um, how can I manage the thing that I do and do it well and share it with people, but carve out the time I need to, to market it and to watch the business side of it, to do strategic planning, to do all of those businessy things, but still be me mm. and still do the thing that I was put here to do. Hmm. And so I call it conscious business. I know there's a lot of people who talk about conscious business and conscious capitalism and all of those things. For me, the definition of it, um, well, there's actually four pillars of conscious business that I really appreciate and um, uh, something that most of us agree on. And that's that you have conscious leadership, that you, the people that you work with within your company, even if you're a solo entrepreneur, the, the independent contractors that you hire, all of you together are focused on the same, you're going in the same direction, that you have somebody at the top that's leading in a specific direction and there's a clear vision and there's clear values. Um, You have buy-in from all of the people in the company, so there's stakeholders, whether it's your employees or your contract people, your vendors are on the same page with you, and if you have a board, they all agree with those those visions uh, and values that you have. And then this culture um, that you create is one that's self-perpetuating. You hire a couple people that are on the same page with you, that next hire better be on the same page or they're not going to last very long because <laughs> you create this culture that everybody wants to be there. And um, I know I hired somebody not that long ago um, to do some work for me, and she didn't fit in. And I knew it, and the other people that I had contracted for work with were saying, why is she here? And they just, it wasn't that they disliked her, but they knew that she didn't fit with this vision and the values that we hold. And so I let her go. And one of the things was, it was a blessing to all of us. Mm. I could say to her, this isn't your place. Um, it's not that I'm rejecting you. It's I wanted you to go and prosper and bless the world with your gifts 
in the place where you belong. This mm. isn't it. And so firing people becomes so much easier <laughs> when you're clear <laughs> on your values. It's not, I'm rejecting you or throwing you away. That's really uncomfortable. That's really ugly. Yeah, well, it, 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 what you're saying, culture. well, yeah, what you're saying reminds me of, of what someone says, that it's easy to say no to something when you have a much bigger yes on the inside. And, and based on your story, it's like, well, it's even easier to say no to certain people, no to employees or no to someone working for me when there's a greater yes, not only for you, but for them as well. Yeah. And even no to yourself. I mean, there's certain things that come along and should I do that? Should I not? Should I spend time on that? Should I chase that certification or that extra education or should I, you know, whatever it is. Um, and the answer comes very easily when you're clear on your purpose, which is the fourth pillar of conscious business. How clear are you on why you're here? Hmm. And, you know, Simon Sinek's work of what is your why? When you know what your why is, when you're very clear on your purpose and your passion, it's so easy to make those decisions. And when every business decision flows out of those values and those pillars, um, you have a business that is completely aligned with your personal and spiritual values. It's so much easier to sustain. And you don't burn out. Mm. I burned out the first time partly because some of my business decisions didn't fit who I am or what my values are. Um, you can't burn the candle at, at all ends and you can't make decisions that don't fit your values and last for very long because it eats away at you. And your employees know that you're not being true to yourself or to your division. Mm. I, re I really like how you are really bringing in a lot of disciplines into into play here the the business approach psychology spirituality i wanted to ask you also uh, just to go back to something you said earlier and this may be beneficial for our listeners because a lot of of people are becoming more familiar with coaching i think mm -hmm. more so than they were 5 years ago maybe um but maybe you could help clarify what is the difference between coaching and therapy, and how how do I know which I need? <laughs> That's a great question, because I um, work in three different fields. I don't really do therapy anymore. I've set that one aside, but I can. Um, I do coaching, and then I do spiritual direction. So what's the difference between coaching and counseling, and what's the difference between that and spiritual work? And to get really clear on what do I need and when I need maybe a combination it's really important in, in hiring the right person for the work that you have to do. And then among coaches, there's all these different niches. Do you need a life coach or a business coach? Mm. It sounds, you know, um, really clear, but <laughs> to understand <laughs> what is the focus yeah. is important. When you need to, I like to think about it in a time continuum. If what you need to work on right now are the wounds of the past, you've had trauma or illness or something behind you that is interfering with your ability to function now, then you probably need a therapist. Um, so with focuses on the past, um, you need therapy. Therapists will deal with today's problems, and they might even look ahead to the future. But the most part, a, a therapist is going to be looking at and examining what has happened to you before now. Um, coaching looks ahead. Where do you want to go, and what do you need to do to get there? So coaching is very future-focused. Um, it's about what behaviors do I need to change right now to get to achieve my goals. So a health coach is focused on um, changing your diet or adding exercise routines or whatever in order to achieve a fitness goal. A life coach might be about building confidence and what do I need to do to become that confident person. Even a business coach, what do I need to change in my business? So that's how you choose the niche. I know I need change. Where's the change? And then you figure out which kind of coach you need. Mm. Spiritual direction is a real love of mine, and that's about the now. How is God showing up for me now, or whatever you call God, um, that higher power? Um, and what do I need to do to feel the divine, to feel inspired, to feel passionate? What are the things that feed my soul? And this is something that has cropped up more and more in the last, and maybe it's my age, <laughs> I'm getting older and, and more mature, and I'm finding that it is so critical for business owners in particular or high-level executives to stay in touch with what feeds your soul. Um, if you don't do that, you will burn out. You'll lose your business. You'll lose the respect of your employees um, because you've allowed yourself to die on the vine. 
you've got to constantly, what Stephen Covey used to talk about, sharpen the saw, mm. and that's feeding your soul. And so that's where spiritual direction comes in because it's about the now. Excellent. That is so useful to be able to to apply that to a past situation, a future result that you're looking for, or a present awareness that you're you're trying to create. So I I, I love that explanation. Thank you so much for for helping to clear that up because because I think that's a with all the different uh, solutions out there, I think that that really helps to narrow down uh, what what do I need to look at and, and what is the best type of approach that, that would meet my needs. You also mentioned something about breaking through belief barriers you didn't even know you had. And I want to focus on the big one that we've been talking about, which is the money issue. Um, what is Why do you think it is that money is such a, a big self-sabotaging issue for people in the helping professions where uh, they they seem to have this this tension between wanting to help people versus the need to earn right. the monies that they need. How do we resolve that? There's so much baggage around money. You know, we have our family of origin issues now talking like a therapist, <laughs> um, we have our, um, the ways that our parents handled money affect us deeply. Um, if you had families, especially if you're older and, and your parents maybe went through depression era or their parents raised them and went through depression era, you know, you, you have um, attitudes of scarcity and fear. Um, you might have, have parents that never learned how to save a dollar. Um, they they just spend everything, and so they're impoverished because they don't know. They might make a lot of money. I kind of grew up in that environment. My dad was an airline pilot. He made great money, but he didn't know how to, to handle money. Um, we lived fine. We didn't live in poverty, but there were times where things were really tight, and we didn't do things like family vacations, partly because of his schedule, but um, he didn't build a nest egg, partly because he had no clue. I'm married to a financial planner now, so I really get, you know, about investing and saving. And, and I'm really thankful because that's not my forte either. Is yeah, you can just kind of outsource that whole invest. thing over to, to your, your I husband. Have. Yeah. <laughs> I have. It, it's not, you know, the, what to do with them. I know I need to, and I know how to build those systems in my business. But um, as to what to do with the money to save it, no, I just hand that all off to him and let him <laughs> deal with it. But, yeah, to answer your question, I think we have all kinds of baggage around money. Then we have the issues of scarcity and abundance. And in my book, you mentioned your belief quotient. There's a whole chapter on abundance. And um, in order to achieve an abundance mentality, which is a way of thinking, it's a mindset, uh, we can go in either direction. Um, if you think about a pendulum, if you swing in one direction, you're, you're going towards scarcity. Um, if you swing in the other direction, you go toward entitlement. And we see that problem also. Mm. And that can be a generational thing. We have kids that were raised that never wanted for anything. Um, their parents just met every single need. And there's a problem with that in that now they grew up thinking that everything is owed to them. Um, and I hate slamming one dire- generation over another, but there is a specific type. There are also people and cultures where this is um, prevalent. And so you don't want to be at either end of the spectrum, right? Mm. You want to learn how to find that abundance mentality and find that center place of balance where you recognize that there is, in this moment, more than enough and more is coming. When you live with that and recognize, I have everything I need right now. And if for some reason you are in any state of lack, then to look around and figure out how have I not used the resources that are around me? Because I firmly believe we have everything we need right now in this moment. And if we're using the resources that are in our hands, not only will I not lack, but the people around me won't lack. This is another tenet of conscious business, and that is what am I doing to build a secure sustainable community? What am I doing to transform the world around me so that people aren't hungry, so that there aren't children dying of diseases that we've cured in this country, um, so that there's fresh water? Um, 
conscious business is about making sure that not only is my family fed, but what am I doing to make sure that the world is also being taken care of? And it's not like I'm going to take everything I have and send it over or that I'm going to let anybody starve here and take care of it. You know, I've, I've heard all of these arguments mm-hmm. of, I guess, uh, trying to do good in other places. Now, there is balance here. And there is, first I feed myself, and then I feel my family, and then it gets exponential. I feed my community, and then I feed the world. Mm-hmm. And I, the more successful I get, the more able I am to do. I like that. And, and that is... That that takes some adjustment, but it it I always go back to what the airline tells you when you're doing the pre flight yeah. thing. You know, if, if you have some kind of an emergency, make sure your oxygen mask is in place before you try to help others. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely right. <laughs> but I loved your question about you know this this baggage that we have about money when we can get past the the old tapes that we've got in our heads the old. Um, negative messages that flow back and forth of, I can't get rid of that, I might need it. Um, No, if we can live simply and um, live with just the resources at hand that we need and then share with others, our world will be fine. Mm. Um, Not getting too political here, but I don't think we need institutions, uh, government institutions, to step in and fix things if we're doing our job as entrepreneurs. I think that we have the potential um, among small business owners to transform the kinds of, of needs that our society have and would never need to rely on a government institution or even taxes. So that, you know, this, this kind of thinking affects every area of your life, your politics, your religion, your <laughs> um, all of these taboos. But the thing is, when you have a business that is sustaining you and sustainable, the world will be different. Mm. And it starts with just me doing what I can and spreading that word and encouraging others to do the same. And there's a group of us that are, are moving forward in that direction, and I hope that we're going to grow. Mm. I've been speaking with Dr. Lisa Van Allen. She is a nationally renowned inspirational speaker and the award-winning author of Your Belief Quotient, Seven Beliefs That Sabotage or Support Your Success. Um this has been very, very educational and informative. And I'm curious because I, I, I'm sure that you have a number of things that you're working on, but I'm wondering if you have any, anything that you'd like to share that you're really excited about. I am. I'm, I'm very excited about a new program that I'm developing. I'm just returning from a year's sabbatical. And as a small business owner, I know when I talk to friends and, and colleagues and clients, um, about taking extended periods of time off, their eyes get big. And it's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Got to take a year off? I mean, is your business going to die? And I'll be honest, those th- thoughts went through my head when I made that decision. Um, I had an injury to my foot and was diagnosed with a, a rare condition and had to figure out medically what I was going to do with that. And then I just was starting to feel the need um, to go deeper and to spend some time reading and thinking and figuring out what's next. And um, so I took a year off and just returned back to my practice in March. Um, That sabbatical was a period of time that just really fed my soul, uh, gave me some ideas for the work that I want to do for the next part of my life. Um, And so I I desperately wanted to return back to work, but I don't want to return to the same exact same work or exact same time frame or structure or whatever. I want to take that sabbatical and create now a sabbatical lifestyle. Hmm. And so I've been kind of testing it out for a few months and talking to friends and colleagues and clients about it. And I've created this program called Sabbatical Living um, and Sabbatical Business. And what does it look like to have a sabbatical lifestyle business? Um, To figure out how can I structure my life and my work so that I have spaciousness, so that I have margin, uh, so I have enough money that I can take time off, so that I have the resources, the team members around me that are competent enough that I can walk away for a while and if I want to do a a meditation retreat somewhere or if I want to take my family to the coast or whatever it is that I need to do to recharge my batteries. And on a weekly basis, how am I building time in that I'm truly taking care of my body, and my soul, my spirit, and my mind. So I'm bringing my A game. We know the research, all of us, we're in leadership, have read the stuff of, about 
taking care of our bodies and about taking breaks and about um, doing creative projects. We know it feeds us and we know that we're better when we do it. We're refreshed and we're sharp and we're on our, our A game, but we don't do it mm-hmm. because we don't think we have the time. We don't think we can. So I did a little experiment about two years ago with some clients about what would it mean to build some of this. I, it's before I even did this sabbatical. It's what would it look like if I worked less? Would it kill my business? And what I found out is if I worked less, I profited more. <laughs> that is such a paradox. Wow, that's my If I work less, I profit more. And so I'm rolling out this new program. I'm going to be doing some webinars on it and uh, doing some group coaching on it and maybe some one-on-one work um, with clients about building a sabbatical lifestyle business. And um, I'm very excited about rolling that out and sharing it with folks. That sounds really exciting. And it reminds me of something Michael Gerber has always talked about, that most small business owners, if they took a month off when they came back, they wouldn't have a business. The employees would have sold it and turned it into a parking lot or something. Uh, exactly. So when you, when you talk about it, taking a year off, that's uh, I mean, that idea comes from academia. And you, know, you get paid to go and recharge your batteries and to do research or whatever it is you want to do. And uh, you come back, you still got your job and you still get your paycheck. It's a little bit more challenging for the business owner, I would I would think, who has not yet learned to systematize their business or the solopreneur who they are the business. How do they begin they to are the do business. this? Yeah. yeah. How do they create I, um, this? Going back to that money conversation we were having, um, fortunately, I have a husband who, you know, kept the rent paid and, um, you know, bought the groceries and those kinds of things. But when it came to the business expenses, um, everything was paid for for that year on the money that I'd set aside. Um, when you plan ahead and you are fiscally responsible and you are setting aside um, money to keep your business going, um, you can do this kind of thing. You can take time off. And so we looked at my expenses ahead of time and we figured out what could I keep doing and what, what did I need? And there were a few things that I let go of, but they weren't essential to my business. Mm. Um, there were some things that I, I took a vacation from and I'm coming back to um, some applications and um, uh, business tools that I stopped using for a while. And now I'm bringing them back in. And yes, so now like I'm earning money and can pay those bills, but to be able to be um, mindful of, of, my physical and emotional and spiritual needs, I need to also be thinking about, okay, what kinds of funds do I need to be um, rabbit holing or saving in order to um, take the time off that I need to take off? I don't think everyone needs to take a whole year off. I needed to. Um, Some of that was for some surgeries and recuperations and that kind of thing. A lot of it, though, was just plain downtime. Mm. Some of it was retreat time. Um, I did a, a short course refresher in spiritual direction um, because it's been 20 years since I certified. I (laughs) figured there's probably some new stuff there that I need to learn. Um, It was, it was a fabulous time. I did a little bit of traveling. I went back to Princeton for a writer's retreat. It was a a remarkable time for me. And then I was able to outline the book that I'm working on right now. I think a retreat or a sabbatical extended retreat or a longer sabbatical is something every business owner and especially every corporate executive ought to be considering. Um, Boards need to send their executive directors of nonprofits on time away. You will get a better person back um, if your company um, plans on that for the leader of your company. Um, But it's something you do have to be prepared to plan ahead for and to do um, and prepare the people around you for. Um, I have uh, a team of uh, independent contractors. I am a solo entrepreneur. I don't have any employees but I have a host of people <laughs> that keep things running for me and put them on hold or the ones that did keep working. I had a few people keep, that kept working. I had my web mistress who kept working on uh, things and a writer who kept doing things because I kept writing during that time. Um, those are uh, people that I had to talk with and explain, I am coming back. <laughs> That's always the big fear, right? <laughs> are you really going to come back? <laughs> um, there's, there's a lot of fear stuff that goes on when you have someone take an extended period of time off. Um, but it was a really rich time and coming back and sharing the stories and, and the, the feedback and um, just the vision that I have for, you know, the next 10, 20 years. 
Uh, people are saying, I'm so glad you did this. You're mm-hmm. a different person. My own mentor coach said, you know, you're so um, high energy, high speed. You have so many ideas going at once. But sometimes Lucy you used to seem almost manic And she said, now you're almost zen. You're not there yet. <laughs> but she, she likes hearing the quieter, more focused. Definitely more relaxed, Lisa. And I do too. Yeah. I like the woman that I've become because of this time off. That is really encouraging and and very inspiring. If our listeners wanted to find out more about uh, business strategy, psychology, spirituality, all of the the things that you help them work through, as well as to find out more about this sabbatical lifestyle, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, if they can go to www.lisavanallen.com or drlisavanallen.com, it both will work that way. Um, just go to my website. Um, you can go to the contact page and send me a message if you're interested. There's also a button um, that you can schedule time with me. The first hour is always free. Um, and so a complimentary session, just exploring if this is something that's for you would be great. Um, I don't have any time scheduled yet for the group project that we're getting together but I'll be putting out some uh, pages on the website soon uh, so that people can keep an eye out for that. But uh, yeah, send me a message and let me know you want more information and we will get in touch. Excellent. And and you have shared so many really good words of wisdom, but um, as we close, are there any final thoughts or, or takeaways that you'd like to leave us with? Well, I think the main thing is to recognize that when you feel like life is too much, it is. You've taken on too much. So to get really clear on what your boundaries are, where you need to say no. You talked earlier about, you know, when you're really clear on what your ass is, no becomes easy. Mm -hmm. And so recognize that when you say no, you're saying no to all kinds of yeses that um, weren't yours to begin with. So get comfortable saying no, but recognize what you are saying yes to with that no. Um, Get very comfortable with living and aligning yourself with your values with those no's. Because when life feels overwhelming, when you feel stressed out, when you feel tired, when you're not sleeping through the night, and I've always been somewhat of an insomniac, but you know what? The last, oh, I don't know, six months or so, I'm learning how to sleep. Mm. What's that about? You know, a really good night's sleep. I'm not waking up thinking, oh, I need to do this, and I don't want to forget that. And, And sometimes it was great ideas for a book or whatever, but you know what? I'm recognizing... I can do that during the daytime now because Mm. I have time on my calendar to reflect and write and to ruminate where before the only time I could do it was in the middle of the night. Mm. So when you feel overwhelmed or when you feel overloaded, it's because you are (laughs) admit it to yourself and recognize that you need to start making space on your calendar. Everyone has the same 24 hours. It's what you do with it. And if you don't do something about it, your soul will. Um, I think it's Sandra Beck, uh, who is kind of considered Oprah's coach. She writes in O Magazine. Or Martha Beck, I'm sorry. Martha Beck is her name. She says that your soul speaks to you through joy. So, you know, live in joy. Let your passions and your joys lead you. But then the rest of the quote is, if you don't pay attention, it sends misery. So let's mm-hmm. live in joy so that we don't have to live in misery. Excellent words of wisdom. Uh, Dr. Lisa Van Allen is a nationally renowned inspirational speaker. She's an author as well as a coach who helps people learn how to make a difference while making money. Uh, Dr. Van Allen, thank you so much for being on Business Innovators Radio today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been delightful. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.